book of Isaiah now, chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. We were having meetings in Hatboro, Pennsylvania a few a couple of years ago. Uh, tent services, and um, there was a, a restaurant owner that was coming. Uh, Gus had been had a number of Christians working for him at a very, very busy restaurant. It was a good, great restaurant. But Gus was searching. And uh, he was searching for the missing piece in his life. He was successful and great business. He had had some Christians uh, working for him. Some of the young women in the assembly there in, in Hatboro had been working with Gus. And um, there was another school teacher who was a real soul winner and, and Vicki had taken a real interest in Gus. Uh, some of her daughters had worked for him and so during the, the meetings it was obvious that God was speaking to him and so she just passed on a little card and I just couldn't help but think of the missing piece when Peter was talking about that and on the card it simply said this, Gus if you have everything but Christ you have nothing. But Gus if you have nothing but Christ you have everything. You say, that's a bit simplistic. No, that's the truth of the gospel. That Christ, the Lord Jesus, makes the difference, both in this life and in the eternal ages. And so tonight, I'd like to speak a little bit more about the Lord Jesus. And so in Isaiah 53, and we're going to read verse number 3. He is despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of the word is the punishment of our peace so that we could have peace was upon him. And with his stripes, with the stroke that he experienced, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity or the sin of us all. Now don't turn to it, but I'm going to read one last verse in 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter is going back and he's tracing what the prophets wrote about. And just listen to this. 1 Peter 1 and verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand. Notice this. The sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. That's the order. The sufferings of Christ first and the glory that should follow. The last few nights we've been looking at this matchless person. And as we've already said, the Lord Jesus is the, the very focus of the gospel message. You see, what you do with Christ personally will impact your life now and will impact your life forever. It's not a matter of what church you belong to. It's not a matter of what kind of a lifestyle you might live. Whether you're religious or non-religious, that's not in view. What you do with Christ will determine your eternal destiny. And so we have been able to look in nights gone by about his statement. He says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, and that actually did happen on the cross, he was lifted up. He says, I will draw all men or all people unto me. And I can't help but wonder in this Friday night meeting whether there's perhaps someone here and you might not be aware of it, but he is drawing you. He has an interest in you. He's seeking to bring you close to him for eternal blessing. John chapter 4 has brought before us a different feature of the Lord Jesus. We understand from that, from that very interesting story that he is the Savior who satisfies. Here's a very, very broken life. A woman who's gone through five relationships, married five times, now living with another man, and still searching. And perhaps there's someone here, maybe not, that's not your lifestyle, but there's something missing. Life hasn't really accomplished or brought into your life what you had hoped it would bring. 
You're still not satisfied. And here's a woman in John chapter 4. She found that Christ met her need and satisfied her soul. That is the reality of salvation. And last night, we understood or we were able to see from the very interesting story of the Lord Jesus going through Jericho that at the cry of a beggar, he stood still. The standing Christ. And if there's someone here tonight and you're wondering, does he have an interest in me? The answer is yes. Would he ever stop when I call? The answer is yes. You see, he's a personal savior. He knows where you are. And he is longing as he passes along by your life that you might understand your need and you might receive him. Well, tonight I'd like to look at the suffering savior. The suffering savior. We've read about the sufferings of the Lord Jesus in Isaiah chapter 53. Now let me just give you a very quick backdrop, backdrop to this because Isaiah 53 tells us of, of a time in the future when the nation of Israel will look back and they will understand that we despised and rejected him, but he came all the same. And if they'll be able to say, surely he has borne our griefs, and he, and he did carry our sorrows, and so they will look back. But when it was written, it was prophecy. Isaiah was writing about a person that was coming 700 or 750 or 800 years down the road. And when he came, the people didn't expect the type of visitation that he brought. You see, the problem with the Lord's coming is that he didn't fit their mold. He didn't meet their expectations, and I'm afraid today that the same is true. That when people come in contact with the gospel, and they are brought to understand the claims of God upon them, and many times they say, well, that's not for me because that's not really what I want. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came, he did not meet their mold. He did not fit their mold. They, you see, they wanted a Messiah. They wanted a mighty deliverer that would release them from the, from the bondage of being under the Roman government. They wanted to have a glorious future. They wanted to be number one in the world. And sadly today, that the same is true in a very personal way. That people want a God that will meet their expectations. They want a God that will give them endless blessings. Full liberty to live the way they want. No restrictions. And certainly no consequences in the end. They want to have a God that just meets their expectations. Their dreams. Their desires. And yet we have read tonight about the one who came. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And when he came, he came as the suffering Messiah, the suffering Savior. The verses that we have read bring before us three amazing truths. And I, and I hope you understand the, the, the truth of Isaiah 53. Because when we look at these words, these verses, we understand that, number one, he suffered from man, from those that he had come to bless. He suffered from man. But there's another feature to the suffering Savior because it says he suffered with man. With man. Surely he hath borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows. And the nation will ultimately acknowledge that he didn't stand aloof from them. He came right alongside and, and he wept with them. And he, he talked with them. He moved among them. He carried their sorrows and he experienced their same grief. He suffered with them. But before this meeting closes, I want to get to the, 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 the greatest truth concerning the sufferings of Christ. And tonight we want to tell you that the Lord Jesus suffered for man. For man. And that makes the difference. He suffered from man. He suffered with man. And he suffered for man. He is despised and rejected of man. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Do you find that a bit strange? Why he would suffer from, from individuals from this world? Because it's, it's still happening, isn't it? He is despised in Surrey, Vancouver, White Rock, whatever you come from. He, he's still given the outside place. 
And as we focus on individual lives here, and I have to, have to acknowledge that it marked my life for almost 22 years, that I knew a lot about him, but he meant nothing to me. I was embarrassed. I didn't want to identify with him. I, I hardly want to even be seen carrying a Bible. He's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And you know, as we focus on the, on the life of the Lord Jesus, we find that from the get-go, from the very start, he experienced the sorrows and the suffering that came from those that he had actually come to bless. Ever thought about his life? It was a difficult one. The hymn writer says his path was uncheered by earthly smiles. And I know that's very poetic, but it's true. It's true. You see, his, his birth was questioned. Question. Remember what they say? Um, we, we, we haven't been born of fornication like you have. And, and there was a stigma, there was a big question mark over, over his birth. His birth was, was questioned. And then as he spoke, his words were, were twisted. They, they played havoc with his statements. And they attributed his works to the, to the power of the enemy of darkness. Very few ever came back and said, thank you. In fact, you remember when he, when he fed the 5,000, well, 5,000 men, so it likely was 15,000 or more, with five loaves and two fishes. They said, my, this is a win-win. Let's make him our king because this is free bread. But he hadn't come to give free bread. He'd come to give his life. And when he wouldn't deliver on what they wanted, they despised and they rejected him. Ultimately, his death was, was demanded. Away with this man. Crucify. Crucify. And you can just hear the, the volume of, 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 of that crowd, of that mob, crying to Pilate, Crucify! Death demanded. And they weren't satisfied until they saw him on a cross. His burial likely brought them great delight. And his resurrection was denied. His ascension was disregarded. His claims were renounced. And as you look at the life of the Lord Jesus, you find that it was a life that was marked by sufferings from us. In fact, he could say, Reproach, reproach hath broken my heart. I'm full of heaven. There was mental anguish, mental suffering. But when we come to the cross, and I trust that everyone understands what took place at the cross. Because you see, it was there that God allowed puny sinners to lay their hands on Christ. And whatever they could do to him, they did. They invaded his personal space and they spit upon him. I don't know of anything more despicable, more degrading than for one human being to actually spit into the face, into the face of another fellow human being. But they are actually spitting into the face of the mighty Creator, the God that actually was holding their very breath in His hand. He was despised and rejected of man. They tore the beard from His cheeks. They raked His back with a, with a Roman lash. They struck him and blindfolded him. Somebody said, hey, he claimed to be a king, so let's make him a crown. And so somebody must have gone outside or somewhere and got some thorns and put it into the shape of a crown and they beat it down into his brow. And grown men bowed their knee with mockery and said, hail, rejoice, king of the Jews. He suffered from man. And then they led him out to Skull Hill. And there they crucified him. Real nails through his hands and through his feet. A cross was lifted up. And sitting down, they watched him there. Did he suffer? Yes, yes. Did he deserve it? No. Because you see, he'd only brought blessing. He had only spoken truth. He'd only showed amazing grace. In fact, he said, I am come. 
I am come all the way from heaven. I am come that you might have life. You might have it abundantly. Now, he wasn't speaking about physical life, was he? I mean, he was talking to individuals that were alive. So he wasn't talking about physical life. No. He was talking about eternal life. About what our existence is all about. And he says, I am come that you might have life. And not just a little segment of it. That you might have it abundantly. And you know, when a person comes to receive the Lord Jesus, they are brought into eternal blessing, and not just part. The Bible says we have been blessed with every, every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. I don't know about you, but I am enjoying salvation. I really am. I, don't, I have bad days and hard days and gloomy days. I'm not just talking about Vancouver weather, although I'm waiting for the sun any day. No, there's, there's, there's tough times. But I wouldn't trade any of the bad days. Because you see, Christ makes the difference. He does. And yet, this one who had come to bring us eternal life, I mean, eternal relationship with, with him, he was despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He suffered from man. But I'm thankful to tell you tonight, very simply, he suffered with man. Suffered with man. Sometimes people say, well now, if there's a God, why doesn't he do something? Why, why does he seem so aloof? Why, why does he, he seem so indifferent? Is he deaf? Is he alive? Does he even care about us? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came, he, he didn't bunker down in, a, in an ivory tower away from his civilization. No, he was born into a very humble home, likely a very poor home. He grew up in a despised, despised town. You remember what they said, well, what good thing can come out of Nazareth? Who wants to live in Nazareth? Well, that's where he grew up. But he never stood at, at a distance from us. At the age of 30, years of age, he began to move freely through the country. And he touched people with blessing. He drew alongside of, of aching, sad, broken hearts. And he spoke words of peace. There's a woman who was brought to his presence and the, well, she was guilty. It was obvious she had committed moral sin, caught in adultery. I've often wondered, well, where was the man? But it was a trap, you see. And they brought this, this sad, broken, guilty woman and thrust her into, into his presence. And they said, uh, Moses commanded that this type of sin should be, person should be stoned. What do you say? And to recall the drama, when suddenly all those men left, and the Lord Jesus very graciously said, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. I want to tell you tonight that he is, he is a compassionate Savior. He saw a large crowd coming. And they had actually gone around the lake because they were weary. And they were looking for just a, just a quiet place. And then they saw the crowd coming. And the disciples likely groaned. Oh no, here they come again. The Lord Jesus looked at them and he was, he was moved. Moved with compassion. You know why? He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And you know, as he follows your life, and you might be successful, you might be in the driver's seat, you might have everything going for you, humanly speaking. But as he looks at your life and he follows your course, he is still moved with compassion. You're going it alone. You're lost, you're astray, you're off the, off the target, off the mark. All we like sheep have gone astray. And he sees where that, that road is leading. And he knows what the end of that road is going to bring for you. And he was moved with compassion because he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. It must have been a very touching scene to see this, this same Savior looking over a city. And he wept. Do you know of anybody that has ever wept over Surrey or Vancouver or Deep Cove or White Rock or Langley? 
Now we, we don't weep over those cities, do we? But he did. He did. Real tears. Wept over a city. Because he'd come right alongside and they didn't know that this was their golden moment of visitation when they could be blessed eternally. He knew it was coming for him and he knew what was coming for them and he wept, wept of concern and love. And yes, he drew alongside of two sorrowing sisters, heartbroken sisters. And he didn't say too much, did he? He just said, where, where have you laid him? That was Lazarus. He says, Lord, come and see. And as they went out to the cemetery, one of the shortest verses in the Bible is so, so poignant with meaning, isn't it? Jesus wept. Jesus wept. You see, he, he was moved. He was moved with what we are experiencing. He still is. You see, he, he suffered with us. Surely he has borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows. Our sorrows became his sorrows. And tonight we want to tell you there is a, there is a compassionate Savior who is suffering with us. But I want to tell you tonight because time is gone, but Isaiah 53 and 5 is a, is a wonderful truth. Because Isaiah picked... I don't know if he picked up his pen at this point, but he says, but, but, he was wounded. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment so that we could have peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. What, is, what does that verse mean? Very simply, my dear friend, tonight, that verse tells us of what took place at the cross. 750 or 800 years down the road when the Lord Jesus Christ bore our sins in his own body upon the tree. He came to be our substitute. He came to stand in our place. He came to bear the shame and accept the blame for our, our sins. That's what Calvary is all about. And as we look at Isaiah 53 and 5, I just want to ask you one question. Who did the wounding? And who did the bruising? Oh, you see, that's what the soldiers did. That's what the little people did. Well, yes, they did. But that's not the truth of Isaiah 53 and 5. No. You know who did the wounding? He was wounded for our transgressions. And in Isaiah 53 and 5, a righteous, holy God took up dealings with the sin bearer on a cross and as the hymn writer and I love this hymn because I learned it after I was saved as the hymn writer so wonderfully puts it so simply puts it all my sins were laid upon him Jesus bore them on the tree God who knew them laid them on him and believing I go free you see what took place at the cross is that God punished the sin bearer instead of the sinner I deserve to bear my the judgment for my sin eternally and yet wonderfully amazingly graciously voluntarily in the midst of a violent death there was a man who loved us so much that he willingly went to the cross and suffered for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God last fall that would be September of 17 um, we, we, got, we got some really wonderful news. There was a, a young man. Well, I call him young. He's about 38, so he's pretty young. But um, we, we heard that Bobby Harbin, working up in Fort McMurray or some of the camps up there, had trusted Christ. And this past February, we were in Newfoundland in Gander Bay, and uh, Bobby was there. And so I said, Bobby, I want to talk to you. I want to hear the story. You see, Bobby grew up in a, in, a, in a Christian home, in the assembly there, and I can well remember he would sit in the second row with his brother Jason, and uh, these two fellas, they were, they were great singers. I mean, they, they, they had good, tremendous volume, and they could really sing. So I was always glad when Bobby and Jason were in the front row, and they were, they were belting it out. But Bobby and Jason grew up. 
and suddenly the gospel wasn't for them anymore. They just wandered off. I lost track of Bobby. And uh, then last September, we got some news that Bobby had visited his grandmother in the hospital, and that grandmother who's just recently gone home to heaven, she, she sensed, she sensed that, that um, Bobby was thinking about his soul. And she said to someone, she says, I, I think that Bobby is on the, on the threshold of salvation. Well, that got back to him. Somehow the, the news kind of made its way through the maze and, and uh, it got back to him that his grandmother thought that he was on the threshold, on the verge of salvation. And it was true, Bobby was deeply stirred and so one night, he, or one day he called up his dad. Fort McMurray or down to Clark's Head, Newfoundland. He said, Dad, I want you to pray for me. He said, I want to be saved. His father, Robert, he said, we weren't expecting that call. We, we didn't see it coming. There was no indication that, that Bobby was even concerned. So he tried to help his, his, his son, married with a, a little family by now. And Bobby went to bed. But, you know, he told us in February that before that conversation took place, he, he, he was working on a front-end loader. And he said, there was a day when I just dropped the bucket. And, and I just said out of, out of my heart, oh, God, don't give up on me. Don't give up on me. And he said, it almost seemed as if God came right back to me. And he says, Bobby, I haven't given up on you. You've given up on me. And so he says, I, be, I began to search the, the web for, for testimonies of how people got saved. And he said, there was one day, and this was thrilling to me, there, there was one day I was, I was looking at this man, he was giving his testimony, it was very interesting. But he says, behind, behind the speaker on the, on, the, on the wall of whatever it was, church or chapel or whatever it was, he said, were the words of, of a verse of scripture. John eleven twenty eight. the master is come and is calling for you. And he says, I, I forgot all about, the, all about the, uh, the, the testimony. He says, all I can see is the master is come and he's calling for you. And a short time after he called his dad. Well, he went to bed that night. And got up the next morning, deeply stirred. And the words of a hymn came to his, his mind. And, and I don't think Bobby had sung them in 20 years. And, and it's not just a little ditty. It's a hymn that we love to sing. Oh, why was he there as the bearer of sin if on Jesus thy guilt was not laid? Or why from his side flowed that sin-cleansing blood if his dying thy debt has not paid? And as Bobby thought about those words, he thought, well, he did die for me. He did shed precious blood. And in that moment of moments, he picked up the phone. He says, Daddy, he says, I just got saved. Just got saved. Understood for the very first time the truth of Isaiah 53 and 5. He was wounded for, oh, he could say my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The punishment so that I could have peace was all upon Christ. And with his stripes, I am. I wonder, what does, what does Christ mean to you? And, and what do the sufferings of Christ mean to you? Because every person that has come to receive him has appreciated and is able to say, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What a sacrifice. What love. What a tremendous gulf that was bridged there. And tonight your load could be lifted. You could, you could receive Christ as the as the missing piece at the night you could leave with the wonderful blessing of having Christ as your Savior and the enjoyment of everlasting life. Let's pray.